I'm Ruchi Mukherjee for TV Asia here at the Western Oaks Gallery for a wonderful luncheon, but more than that, amazing cause, Ek Disha, we spoke about. Rick, welcome to TV Asia. And tell us, how did you meet her and what motivated you to bring her? Well, I met her at TED India, which was a, a conference of, a, it's a brainstorming session, people from all walks of life, it's uh, stands for, I think, technology, entertainment and design, and they hosted their first conference in India uh, a couple of years back, and Sunita was one of the speakers, so when I was talking about her, she really uh, rocked the whole uh, place, uh, brought this topic, which is kind of hard to discuss, and very forcefully she talked about it, and standing ovation, uh, she raised a lot of funds there, and I got to meet her there and then uh, we kind of talked about kind of bringing that thing over to the US and kind of helping her with that and we've been very successful uh, and like I said it's not Ek Disha doing much, Prajwala has a huge global following, we are just a tool for them to kind of spread the word and raise some funds. Uh, so it's a partnership that's done very well, uh, we raise a lot of money for a very very great cause. And Ek Disha is based in, Houston, uh, in uh, Houston, Texas? Yes, Ek Disha is a Houston base, we started in 2005 and it's a 501c3 in the US and the, the whole idea was that to help organization like Prajwala that doesn't have a presence in the US but they're doing great stuff so we can kind of reach out and help them so that not every organization in India has to open a partner organization here uh, so we kind of bridge that gap and we go after the small to medium sized NGOs in India uh, Prajwala is an exception they're fairly big uh, but most of our you know projects are fairly small today Sunita frequently travels abroad in honor and recognition of her work Yet that very recognition can be an obstacle if awareness begins and ends with an award. For sex trafficking is not an other country problem, but a transnational organized crime that pervades all countries. For the past decade, the U.S. State Department has issued annual trafficking in persons reports. Yet only in June of 2010 did the U.S. include itself in the rankings. Every year, 17,500 victims are trafficked into the United States. Every day, over 150,000 slaves are working in forced prostitution. 300,000 American children, mostly runaways, are at risk for trafficking. Every two minutes, a child is being prepared for sexual exploitation. Every American who tolerates this crime supports it. Inaction is the last obstacle. When I pray to God, I never say, give me my obstacles. I always say, give me strength to face the obstacles. Very so often when I talk about human trafficking, being an activist for the last 20 years and so, I've had very strange reactions across the world. Once when I was attending a conference for police officers, senior police officers in India, on the issue of human trafficking, after the inaugural session was over, we were all standing out for a cup of tea, and two senior policemen talking to each other, and I was just eavesdropping, standing next to them. One of them was saying, why am I called for this workshop? There's no traffic problem in my jurisdiction. You know, it's in the other part of the city where the flyover is coming up that all the traffic problem is. <laughs> it is amazing because when you talk about human trafficking, we're talking about a problem which is, which is as old as humanity. And it is so concerning that in many parts of the world, including United States, many of us are still knowing about the problem. Many are just getting aware about the problem. I really don't know whether you can imagine the age of the human beings we are talking about when we talk about buying and selling of human beings for exploitation. What is the age of human persons that we are talking about? These are little kids three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds. I don't think they look any different from any of the other Indian children or any other children in the world. But they are different. All these three, four, five-year-old children were sold as commodities in the flesh trade market, to be in a very crude way to put it for prostitution. 
They were raped by hundreds of men. They lost their childhood. I don't think they ever recovered from the trauma that they went through. But when we rescued them from sex tourism and from hardcore prostitution, they were all HIV positive. Some of them were sold by their own parents. One of those children, whose faces I'm not showing right now, was found on a railway track with her intestine out. So many men had raped her that her rectum and vagina opened up and the intestine came out. When we're talking about human trafficking, we're talking about children as young as three, as young as four, as young as five getting sold for exploitation. I have given you an example of sex trafficking. But sex trafficking is not the only purpose for which human beings are sold. I'm going to give the Indian example because I work in India. But please understand it happens everywhere. It happens in the United States too. But in India, you will see trafficking happening for many of these purposes. A couple of years ago, in 2001-2002, a huge scandal broke loose in the state where I work, that's Andhra Pradesh. Babies as young as one day, two days, three days, one month, two months, were bought for hardly $10 and sold for $50,000 and $60,000 in the name of adoption. What was very interesting about this whole scandal was the stakeholders or the traffickers who were involved in it. Orphanages, missionary homes, charitable homes, shelters, including the wife of a director general of police was involved in this whole racket of buying and selling children. Huge scandal that broke in Andhra Pradesh. Immediately after the scandal broke loose, the government put a fact-finding committee. I was part of the fact-finding committee. Overnight, all the orphanages were closed. Adoption rights, no organ organizations could give children for adoption. Everything was banned. And the fact-finding committee was supposed to go to different shelters to study the shelter. One particular shelter when I went to, a place called Standur, close to Hyderabad, where I'm based at. We were in the front of the organization. The police went behind. And when they started digging, they found dead bodies of one-month baby, two-month babies, six-month babies, eight-month babies. And when the forensic experts got into the picture, they found kidneys of the baby missing, retina, cornea, different organs of the body missing. And that brought to light Another form of trafficking, trafficking for organ trade. Hundreds and thousands of kids are sold in the name of labor. In the Indian context, I don't, I don't think you can imagine what forced labor could ever be. In 2003, I had the misfortune of rescuing 13 children from a glass bangle industry. They were glass bangles. My height is 4'6". When I entered this place, there were cubicles which was just up to my waist, three feet. One feet by one feet cubicles, small cubicles. And these little ones, as young as four and five, crouched inside like that with a glass burner, processing glass panels. We had the greatest difficulty to pull out these children from those cubicles because they were hunched like that. They couldn't come out. With a lot of difficulty, we brought these kids out. And during those times, I used to have an office which had a big courtyard outside. The children came and sat there. For 45 minutes, they wouldn't come inside my office. And that's the kind of ritual. After a rescue, I would meet each child personally. No matter what my staff spoke to them, the kids would not come inside. So after 45 minutes, I came out and I said, Beta, why are you not coming inside? And this five-year-old child looks up and says, Auntie, I have not seen daylight for two years now. 
when we're talking about this modern day form of human slavery, I don't think many of us realize what slavery is all about. Hundreds and thousands of kids out there are kept in absolutely subhuman conditions. Conditions that we cannot imagine in labor trafficking, in circus. Trafficking for beggary is one of the biggest money booming industry. When Slumdog Millionaire came out, many of our Indian friends were quite outraged. Why should we project India that way? But unfortunately, it is true. Every year, 44,000 children in India go missing, out of which hardly 10,000 ever get traced. Where are the 34,000 children vanishing every year? And one of the hunches is they are being trafficked for beggary, where they are mutilated, their eyes are removed, their hands are removed, their legs are removed, deformed so badly that even if their biological parent has come and stand before the child, the parent would not recognize his or her own child. Camel jockeying is not such a big problem in India, but in a couple of states like West Bengal, like Andhra Pradesh, Bihar, Hundreds and thousands of kids are taken for camel jockeying to Middle East. I'm sure you know what a camel jockeying race looks like. I don't know whether you can imagine a camel race where a jockey is tied to the leg of the camel and not sitting behind the camel. And therefore, somebody like you who is 60 kilos, 70 kilos, 90 kilos, or me, 40 kilos, we cannot do that. So what is preferred is a 10 kilo, 15 kilo, or a 20 kilo person. This child is tied to the leg of the camel. And the modus operandi is when the child is tied to the leg of the camel, the child is not going to say, ha, 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 very good, very good, you know. The child is going to cry. When the child cries, the camel moves. And when the camel moves, the child cries louder because there's so much of shuffle happening. The camel moves faster. Last year, 100,000 people from Andhra, belonging to Andhra Pradesh were deported back from the Middle East, back to India. Among that 100,000 people was this five and a half year old child. What was very strange about the child was he was completely paraplegic, unshaped wrong. The immigration officials didn't know what to do. The intelligence officials didn't know what to do. They called us, they said, Dr. Sunita, there's somebody here. Can you look after this child? And when I met this child, it took us around 11 days to know what happened. This child told us he was sold for camel jockeying. He belonged to Mushirabad, a place in West Bengal. And there he was tied to the leg of the camel. When the camel race began, the rope broke loose. He fell off the camel. And the hoofs of other camel went on top of him. Out of shock, the child had a paralytic stroke. He told us about the hundreds and thousands of children buried inside the sand there. Voiceless, nameless, never informed anywhere. Unfortunately, hardly any international pressure has changed the situation. For the first time, last year in 2010, 46,000 kids were rescued from, by a Pakistani organization. But among all these forms of trafficking, I think sex trafficking or trafficking for commercial sexual exploitation or prostitution, is the worst kind because it completely demolishes a human being, destroys the person, the soul, the body, the mind, everything. After 20 years doing what I'm doing, I really don't know whether, whether we have completely helped the person recover fully from the trauma the person has gone through. And I work on the issue of sex trafficking. The youngest child that I have rescued is around three years and the oldest woman around 45 years old. I'm just giving you this as an example just to tell you this is what happens in India, but this is also happening in the United States, so please don't take this only as an Indian problem. India is a transit, it's a destination, it's a supply for commercial sexual exploitation. It essentially means large number of girls from all over the world come to India. We have girls from Russia, we have girls from Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Serbia, every part of the world coming to India. It's becoming a growing destination. 
but definitely we are one of the largest suppliers of, for sex trafficking. Sex trafficking per se in India and in the United States is a very clandestine problem. Hardly 6.5% of the problem is visible to people. More than 93.5% of the problem is clandestine, it's underground. The most visible is in the red light areas. You go to Nevada, you will see brothels, you'll see Mustang Ranch, things like that. But if you want to see a real red light area, come to India. You'll see Kamanti Pura where 100,000 girls are standing in one row, like cattle, human cattle waiting to be sold. Red light areas are the most visible form of commercial sexual exploitation. But sexual exploitation happens in the houses, in the lodges, in the parks, in the hotels. It happens in the name of tourism. I don't know how many of you know that 13% of the sex tourists in the world come from America to countries like India, Thailand, Cambodia, Sri Lanka. But not only sex tourism, which is international that happens in India, but we also have a huge problem of domestic sex tourism. Text sex tourism in the form of escort services, sex tourism happening in pilgrimage points, in holy places. And that is a matter of real concern because absolutely uh, horrendous things happen. But pornography, by, by and large, is the worst and the most invisible. Worst because you can actually see a three and a half year old child having sex with a dog or a cat or a horse or having sex with an 80 year old man, but you don't know where the child is, you don't know who made the film, but the CD is in your hand. Europe, America are big buyers of pornography from India. All kinds of pornography from pink films, blue films, gray films, pink films is sex with animals, gray films is sex with dead bodies, and blue films is a novel. It's estimated that more than 3 million women and children are sold in India for prostitution every year. Across the world, every 10 minutes a person is getting sold for human trafficking. Every one minute a person gets sold for sex trafficking in Asia. There is definitely a decrease in the age of the victim. When I started 20 years back, 12 year olds and 13 year olds, I used to be shocked. I said, my God, 12 year old. Today, even seeing a three-year-old, I'm not shocked because age of the child is progressively coming down. There was a huge flood close to Hyderabad in a place called Mahabub Nagar. More than 20,000 people were reportedly killed. And the first persons to go for the flood relief work were my girls. They didn't know who they were. They had no clue. And they have absolutely no reason to help anybody because nobody has ever helped them. They were the first ones who said, Madam, we want to go there. And I was like, do you really want to go there? It's a lot of water and you know, I, whether you'll be able to do it. The first thing they said is, we'll go on leave of absence. We don't want salaries. Withhold our salaries, we will still go, we'll take leave and go there and help. They stayed there for 45 days rebuilt houses for 3,600 people and came back. Girls were trained as masons, carpenters, welders, working there full time. That is for me the miracle of humanity. With me is of course this amazing lady who we heard today and I want to go a step forward I'm just not hearing and I want to make a difference and we all want to make a difference first of all welcome to TV Asia Sunita hi um, first of all of course we heard the story and we were there that why you got into it um, real quick for our viewers how people living in the United States how can they support and how you want them to make a difference I think first of all um, it has to start from the family from the from from your own houses uh, Talking about this issue is the beginning to support this issue because uh, it's important as parents, fathers, mothers to talk to your children about this issue because most of the time people have this perception that it happens to them, it doesn't happen to us. It can happen to anybody, it can happen to your own daughter or your son. So you need to break the silence from the family 
and it's not just about sex trafficking but also about abuse about incest within the family so that the child feels more comfortable to report about abuse and you create a, a general environment of not you know non tolerance for you know this kind of violence and therefore the abusers around you are already you know worried law they will not do what they are planning to do but apart from that i think uh, when you talk about the issue per se as sex trafficking the easiest of course is to give money to mm. you know organizations who are doing this kind of work because this is a very cost intensive absolutely it's financial intensive work and money is something that's required but that's the easiest way okay but uh, the tough way is to provide your skills to volunteer for such causes with your skills you're a teacher you're a homemaker you're a socialite you're an engineer anybody and everybody can contribute to this cause you know but important thing is that this cannot be fashionable you can't make it something like a fashionable option where you come one day and then don't come you have to make it as a consistent commitment of yours giving your time giving your skill is going to be the greatest contribution that you can ever make and for that you need to know in your neighborhood who's doing this work so it's not about somebody in india mm. that you want to support it's also about how you can support your own neighborhood organizations who are doing similar work and today in houston there was a huge amazing great turnout at this luncheon were you happy with the turnout i'm humbled yes i'm humbled by the support yeah. the hope and strength it gives me is amazing especially coming from a world where there's a lot of hostility yeah. lots of threat intimidation and the whole effort is to wipe us out in that kind of a situation this kind of love is absolutely empowering thank you so much